Oh, I think I'm already mic'd. That's right. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about, so I come from a data analyzing kind of point of view. I know a little tiny bit of Python. I'm, I got into visualization because I wanted to tell the story and I wanted to analyze the data to see what the story said. One of the things that happened as, as it became easier and easier to visualize data is that I found I was using visualization to report out the story. So uh, my guess, I guess my pitch is that the first thing you need to focus on is the story. So and I know I'm speaking to a lot of journalists here, but what we're talking about is the, is the who, what, when, where, why, and how. What's the story? I cannot tell you how many times I've had reporters come up to me in the newsroom and say, oh, I just got this data set, can we put it up? No, what's the story? What's the story? What, what do you want to say? What is it showing you? What are the, what are the facts? Is it, did it give, tell you something surprising? Did, are there outliers that you want to explore that, that really are compelling? That's what you, we want to put up. And then we might want to let people download the whole data set in the interest of transparency. That's great. But that's not the story. So you need to figure out what the theme is. You need to interview your data. Think of your data as the man on the street. And go up there with the microphone and say, well, tell me what you know. Tell me what you have. So the thing that you want to do is you want to avoid notebook dump. So a lot, most of the journalists in the room will probably have experienced this, where when you, especially if you first, when you first start out as a reporter, you go out and you cover some event and you come back and your notebook is full. You have written down everything, everything everyone said, every quote, every fact, and you come back and you start writing your story and you want to prove your worth. So you put it all in the story, including the same quote that three people said in three different ways. You don't need all of that information. You don't want to dump all of your data out there for somebody. You want to be able to, to tell your story. Stick with your nut graph, your theme. So here's an example of what you don't want to do. This is a story. It's not a bad little blog post about Fullerton city workers who made over $100,000. And then they said, you know, you want to see the salary data? We'll show you the salary data. Great. Well, I want to see some more trends in this data. So I click on the link for the salary data, and this is what I got. <laughs> this is not helpful to me. <laughs> so at the Seattle Times, we did, and I'm not uh, holding out the Seattle Times as any great example of this, but we did a similar one. Actually, let me go back. I think I forgot to click on the link. Um, where we took a look at the city data, uh, salary data, and we found that there were three departments that drove most of the uh, six-figure workers. So we wrote a story about what was going on. It turns out it had to do with contract negotiations and, and uh, police, fire, and utilities. And then we visualized the data. We did some charts, you can see there, that were for the paper. And then we created a visualization that started with the theme, it echoed the nut graph in the story, and that is that there were th these departments that drove the increases in salaries. And so what we did was we started our visualization with those departments checked, and that's what the reader would get. Now that allows the reader to still go ahead and explore the data by looking at other departments. And, and you can see that it also solves a problem for us. You see that line that just appeared at the bottom. That's transportation. Because the scale is so different, why starting with the, the three that made the most difference, we could really show the impact. And then by being able to check off and on, we can then get a better sense of what was happening in the other departments. So what that did was that, that focused on the story. And then it allowed the, the reader to explore the data and figure out their own sidebars. So how do you go about focusing on the story? As I said, you interview the data. You use the nut graph as your theme to help develop the strong visualization. The data can be more than just numbers. It's not always in a spreadsheet. Are there little stories that the reporter has discovered that can then be fleshed out and become a visualization unto themselves? And can you take different data, data points, disparate data points, to help tell the main story in another way? So this is an example, this was our uh, 
methadone investigation, which won a Pulitzer Prize, and my involvement in it was about this big, but I, I was involved with some of the visualizations. And what the story did was it talked about how the state had put methadone on the preferred drug list, and uh, that meant that folks with, who were on Medicaid, basically poor people, were being given methadone more often than almost anybody else. And so the overdose deaths were predominantly uh, poorer folks. And so we, as a result of this project, they took it off the preferred drug list within, I think, a couple of weeks after we, we published the investigation. So that's the, that's the crux of the story. And the crux of the visualizations, and you can see there are quite a few, all support that story and, and allow you to explore it in different ways. We had visualizations talking a look at how use had skyrocketed, taking a look at the deaths from methadone compared to other drugs. And then we also um, used a map. And this we actually used in the reporting process. So the reporter was, was interviewing the data and he comes to uh, Justin Mayo, our computer assisted reporting specialist, and says, you know, I really want to see where these deaths occurred and I have it in the database. So Justin mapped it and then he put it over census data, speaking of how useful census data can be. Uh, and we found that the deaths were occurring in areas with lower income, lower median incomes. And so that made it even more interesting for us. So we took another step to try to tell the story, to tell the, the data, show the data visually. And that is that we built it, most videos are narrative videos, right? And you have somebody talking or it's a, it's a really compelling story. We did a video that, um, and I'm just going to play a couple seconds because I know I don't have a lot of time, but it, um, it's all data. We actually did a lot of other interviews uh, for this video, and then we ended up just telling the data story. Do you have sound? Does this have sound? Oh, it doesn't have sound. Well, so I'm just going to show you this visual and talk you through it. So. Uh, let's see, it's about right here. What we did was we visualized the mapping of the data. This is talking about Medicaid population and then the deaths. And then this is how we mapped it for the video. So it's, it was, it's talking about how there were 173 deaths and that, that we mapped it and it showed that the, the deaths died at, the people in poorer areas died at more than three times the rate. So they're showing all of the deaths and then they zoom in and this is an area, the first area was Everett and it had, so basically it goes into, it zooms into these working class neighborhoods and it shows the deaths and then it goes to like the second area it showed was Bellevue and it had eight deaths. More population, higher income, more deaths, I mean let fewer deaths. So it allowed us to take that data and show it in a way that really brought the reader in. But it was all based on the, what, what is the story? What is the arc of the story? And we wanted to be able to show that juxtaposition in a way that was compelling. Here's another one. This is an example of when I was talking about, is there a narrative component to your story that you can use to tell it, to break it down into its kind of component data pieces, your information pieces, and tell that story? So we just, uh, Mike Barron's at the Seattle Times just did an investigation into elephants and elephant uh, mortality and health at, at zoos. And basically the, the nut graph was that, that zoos had hidden the, uh, problems with elephants because they are big crowd pleasers, right? So they, they bring people into the doors of the zoos um, and they kept trying to breed these elephants so that they could keep them, keep elephants in the zoos. But it turns out that the, the, the zoos, that they've died at a much higher rate than in the wild. So we pulled out one family of elephants, the family tree of thong law, where they bred and we told it visually. So we just charted out the family tree. And so, and we showed how they bred sibling to sibling, father to daughter, father to granddaughter, and then we showed the deaths. And of this, I think 22 elephants in this family tree, I think there are only, it's either six or eight uh, now elephants still living. 
And so again, that was just a narrative example. But he had, but the reporter had, and he's a data-minded reporter, he had all of the information in a spreadsheet. So we got one of our web developers and he built this in JavaScript and it was just a great way to be able to tell this, again, using a, an anecdote, basically. Taking the anecdote and breaking it down to its component pieces. So kind of the final point I want to talk about is to be open to the possibilities. There are, there are any number of elements that can tell a story. So many years ago, in the 1990s, I was, I was working at a small news, newspaper in Montana and I got sent up to a Native American reservation because the community up there had called and said that their principal was racist and they were picketing the school. And would you, you know, come cover this? So I drove three and a half hours to, draw, to cover this story, wrote up the story, tried to find a phone to send my story in. There were only two phones in town. One was in the school, which was closed, and one was at the home of this couple called Clarence and Marge Cuts the Rope. And so I went up to Clarence and Marge's house, and they invited me in, and I talked to them and interviewed them, and I sent my story, and they watched it go. This was line, you know, back when you could see it, like line by line, going over the phone line. And then they were very interested in this process. I didn't think much about that. Finished my story, got back in the middle of the night, seven o'clock in the morning, the phone rings, and it's Clarence, cuts the rope. And he said, hi, got back okay. And I'm like, yeah, it's seven in the morning. Yeah, thanks, Clarence, I got back, still sleeping. But he says, oh, well, you know, did your story go in the paper? Yeah, I remember I sent it last night from your house. It went in, the t in today's paper. Oh, that's good. Long pause. He says, I is it a long story? Well, it's about 25 inches, not real long. I said, oh, okay. In the long pause, he says, you know, we don't get the paper for another two days. So, what? Would you mind reading that article to Marge, and then she'll tell everybody what it says, and we can figure out what we're going to do next? So I did. I read that story to Marge. I sat in a rocking chair. This was in the 90s, okay? I, and I read this story. I felt like I'd gone back in time. So what's the story here? I mean, I wrote a story about the principal, and he got reassigned. But what's the real The story is, my gosh, what a remote, uh, they're that I mean, it's that hard to get news, it's that hard to get information. And so I've always thought the story here is this lack of technology in rural areas. And so this is a map of Fort Belknap. And there are, in the entire county, 1,293 people, and that was from the 2010 census. I think it had gone, so and there were even fewer in, from in the 90s. And so there has actually been a story done by a group of students at the University of Montana about kind of the remoteness of this area. And I've always thought, you know, you could really build some great data visualization out of this. And they ended up doing stories and, and photos, and I think they've missed an opportunity, just like I missed it back in the 90s, because I didn't go back and tell this story. But these are, this is just a story, right? It's just a narrative story. There's no data, I don't have a spreadsheet. But I could pull together all kinds of information that would illustrate that point. So for example, this is, this is, uh, broadband access. So this little area where it's kind of gray, where there's no access, there you go, that's it. Right there, see that gray spot? That's it. Here we go. They have very little access to anything, and this is now. So there's still a, a story to be told, and there's still data to be gathered. The whole point is to have that reporting mindset that you can gather in data points to buttress an anecdotal story that is compelling. You, and it can be everything. It can be, it can be personal histories. It can be data points like cell phone coverage. It can be census population. It can be photos. It can be all kinds of things. And you can build that to make a really powerful visualization. And so, and I, I haven't done that yet, but here is an example of just how you can get across how remote a particular area is. That's the road to Fort Belknap. So, my point is you can take an anecdote, you can take any kind of information that makes a story and visualize it if you think about it in ter terms of breaking down into the component pieces.